In this video we're going to take a look at the Heathkit HD10 electronic keyer. I'll give some background on what keyers are. I'll talk about the history of this unit and some of the other keyers that Heathkit made. I'll show the circuitry inside and I'll talk a bit about the restoration of this particular unit. Finally I'll give a demonstration of it being operated and I'll also show a couple of other modern keyers. Morse code or CW is a method of communication used in amateur radio. The commercial use of Morse code ended around the beginning of the 21st century and the mandatory requirement for knowing Morse code was dropped from international amateur radio regulations in the early 2000s. Despite that, it continues to be a popular form of communications in amateur radio and offers a number of advantages over voice and other forms of communication. While traditionally sent using a hand key or straight key, like this one, the speed and accuracy when using a straight key is limited, and it can be tiring for the operator, and extended use can even lead to injuries like carpal tunnel syndrome. An improvement was the bug, which used two switches and could send dots automatically when one side was pressed. These were entirely mechanical devices. By the 1940s, electronic keyers were developed that could send both dots and dashes automatically. One of the first was designed by Jim Hicks, W9TO, and was sold by Helicrafters as a commercial model HA1. It used six vacuum tubes and a mercury wetted relay for switching. While I was making notes for this video, the October 2017 issue of QST magazine arrived and has a fascinating article about this unit. Researching other electronic keyers dug up some other articles including electronic keying from April 1940, transistorized electronic key and monitor, May 1959, and a monitor electronic key and keyer, December 1962. Modern keyers are microprocessor controlled, tiny, and offer features like message memory. I'll demonstrate a couple of modern keyers at the end of this video. The HD10 was Heathkit's first entry into the CW keyer market. According to a review of the keyer in the March 1966 issue of 73 magazine, the design was based on the W3 OPO keyer, which appeared in the December 1962 issue of QST magazine. Heath engineers improved the circuit, adding some additional features and building the keyer and a paddle into a single unit. As well as being Heathkit's first keyer, it was the first keyer kit on the market. It was made from 1965 to 1974 and sold in the U.S. typically for U.S. dollars $39.95. Heathkit reportedly sold tens of thousands of them until it was replaced by the more sophisticated HD1410 which was offered from 1975 to 1984. In 1981 the SA5010 Micromatic was offered, updated to the SA5010A in 1985 and was sold until 1991 almost up to the time Heathkit exited the kit market. Also offered around that time was the HD8999 CW keyboard which was not strictly a keyer but could send Morse code from a computer style keyboard. The HD10 is a transistorized design with solid state keying, in other words no relay. It can send at speeds of 10 to 20 or 15 to 60 words per minute determined by a wiring option. It features self-completing dots and dashes and a built-in paddle. It works with grid block keying or other transmitters that use negative bias provided it does not exceed 105 volts at 35 milliamps. This included most Heathkit equipment of that era. In addition to the built-in paddle, you can connect a straight key or an external paddle. It can optionally be wired for manual dash mode, like a bug, where it sends space dots but the user has to manually key the dashes. The built-in paddle has a lot of travel and is not externally adjustable. Serious CW users often probably opted for an external paddle like this high quality bencher unit. It has an internal side tone generator with speaker, headphone jack, and you can connect the audio to a receiver. A hold switch position turns the key on continuously for tuning up the transmitter. It operates from 120 volts AC. The manual describes how to modify it for 220 volt AC operation by installing a capacitor in series with the line cord to drop the voltage. It also supports external battery operation using two 22.5 volt batteries or one 45 volt center tapped battery. These were common batteries back in the tube radio days but are almost unobtainable today. The unit's in a heavy case with rubber feet that won't move when being operated. 
The built-in paddle at the front is a single lever with a knob that can be used if desired. The usual convention is to move to the right for dots and left for dashes. It can easily be wired for reversed or left-handed operation. I'm actually left-handed but operate with my right hand and follow the standard convention. This leaves my left hand free for writing. A slide switch has positions for off, on and hold which was described earlier. A neon pilot lamp is lit when the unit is on. The left knob adjusts speed and the right adjusts volume of the side tone. There's no facility to change the pitch of the tone. A trimmer adjustment in the center of the speed knob is used to calibrate the spacing of the dots and will be described later. The small speaker is mounted behind a grill. The rear panel has the power cord and a quarter inch headphone jack. A terminal strip is provided with the following connections. There's two ground screw terminals. The hand key terminal is for a hand or manual code key that can be connected from here to ground. Dot is for the dot connector of an external paddle and dash is for the dash connector of an external paddle. Receiver audio can connect to a receiver headphone jack so audio is heard through the keyer speaker or headphones. It needs to be jumpered to ground if not used. Keyed line is the switch line for keying a transmitter and it needs to be within the maximum voltage and current specs. Dash arm is normally connected to the dash terminal. If it's connected to hand key it will work like a vibroplex keyer or bug where dots are sent but dashes are manually keyed. Plus 45 is for connecting to an external 45 volt battery. Battery negative is for a center tap to an external battery. And plus 22 and a half is the same as ground but can be used for the negative side of the external battery. The unit came with a cable to connect from the rear panel receiver audio and ground terminals and a quarter inch headphone jack to plug into a radio receiver. On the bottom you can see the rubber feet, some of the screws for holding unit together and the standard Heathkit model and series number sticker. Let's open it up and take a look inside. Most circuitry is on one printed circuit board which is single sided, silk screened and made from a phenolic material. The unit is all solid state using 11 transistors and 7 diodes. The transistors are type 2N407, there's 7 of those, 2N2712-3 and 1-2N398A. You probably don't recognize any of these transistor types as they're early germanium transistors and quite hard to find replacements for today. The transistors are also in sockets. Back then transistors were expensive and not as reliable as today. They were also more heat sensitive during soldering so it made some sense to socket them. Additional wires run to the front panel controls and to the terminal strip on the rear. Note the unusual potentiometer for the speed control that has two ganged pots plus a trimmer. The key is made from a bar attached to some flexible brass and some additional brass leaf springs. Moving the bar to the left or right engages one of two micro switches. While it lacked the adjustments and fine touch of a more expensive paddle, it was simple and reliable and kept the price down. Chuck Pinson's Heathkit book says the HD10 is not rare and shows up at flea markets on a regular basis, often with problems. Well, that describes this unit quite well. It was bought at a local ham radio flea market in September of 2017 for $10. It came with two cables and no manual and was in unknown condition. I noticed another HD10 a couple of tables down at the same flea market. Opening it up, it looked complete and had all the original parts and the construction quality was quite good. However, when powered on, it was dead with not even the pilot light coming on. Examination quickly showed that the fuse was blown. The 56K resistor for the neon lamp was also broken. It almost looked like it had been purposely cut. After replacing the fuse and resistors, there was still no sound. It was time to peruse the manual. I found a complete copy of one on the internet. I soon learned that it needed an external jumper from audio to ground when not plugged into a receiver. After doing that, it came to life and appeared to be working perfectly. I gave the unit a good cleaning and cleaned the controls with contact cleaner. I checked the ESR of the two large electrolytic caps and they were okay, so I left the original units in. I noticed that this unit was wired for the 10 to 20 word per minute or slower speed range. I checked the other features of the rear terminal like the hand key and support for external paddle inputs. There's an adjustment to be made for the dot duty cycle using the 
trimmer inside the speed control. It says to use a meter and adjust it for half of the voltage when it's sending dots continuously. But I found it's hard to measure such a low frequency voltage because the meter will be constantly moving even on a Heathkit voltmeter of the same era. If you have an instrument that can measure duty cycle, that would be ideal. My digital multimeter can measure duty cycle, but it doesn't seem to be very accurate and not very stable at this low frequency. What I did was use an oscilloscope and adjust it so that the duty cycle was 50-50 on the scope. Basic operation is simple. You turn it on and adjust the speed and desired volume. The tone varies slightly with volume. This is normal. You can then send dots and dashes with the paddle. Hold mode will turn the switch on continuously. If desired, you can connect a hand key to it as well. You can also connect an external paddle, like this bencher unit. For comparison, here's a couple of modern keyers. The one in the middle is a CMOS 4 by Idiom Press and was a kit I built a few years ago. It's microprocessor controlled and has a large list of features including memories for sending recorded messages. A feature of most modern keyers is the so-called iambic mode. Pressing the left paddle sends dots, pressing the right sends dashes, and pressing both sends alternate dots and dashes. This takes some getting used to, but means that fewer actions are needed to send characters. For example, the character C requires four presses with a non-iambic keyer, and only two with iambic. The Heathkit HT10 has a simple circuit and doesn't support iambic keying. Here's another modern unit, the Ham Gadget Pico Keyer Plus. It has a microprocessor inside and not much else. It runs in a coin cell which can last for years. It has memory, iambic mode, and can switch high voltages of either polarity. It was a kit that cost $26, including the case. So there you have it. The HD10 was the first electronic keyer kit on the market. While it lacks some modern features like iambic mode and memories, it's impressive what could be done with just a few transistors in the days before microprocessors. Some hams are still using this keyer, especially with matching Heathkit gear of the same vintage. I have yet to try it on the air. I'll have to fire it up with my Heathkit DX60B, HW16, HW101, or HW8.